The Subcommittee on Workforce Protections will come to order. I note that a quorum is present. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to call a recess at any time. How can we ensure that American workers remain secure and prosperous in the modern economy? Expanding access to benefits is central to that goal. Benefits, including paid leave, retirement, health insurance, life insurance, child care allowances, and more, are indispensable in today's American workforce. According to the Society of Human Resources Management, 60% of employees find benefits extremely or very important when considering future jobs. However, millions of hardworking individuals across the country lack access to such benefits. Independent contractors who are not covered by federal employment statutes have indicated the benefits are important to them, but not at the expense, this is important, not at the expense of their flexible work schedule. For instance, a 2020 survey of rideshare drivers showed that 67% of drivers prefer to get benefits with their independent contractor status intact instead of receiving benefits through traditional employment. Now, estimates vary, but on the high end, nearly 70 million American workers rely on independent forms of work, and on the low end, about 17 million. This segment of the workforce is only growing. That is a lot of lives, children, families, that may not have reliable benefit coverage, no matter how you slice it. So there are two basic ways forward. One is to accept that tomorrow's workforce will have less access to benefits than today's. I think the better course, however, is to transition to a new model in which benefits are attached to the worker and not the employer. We should not resign our workforce to the constant struggle of searching for benefits uh, every time they uh, pursue a new form uh, of work. American families should not be put at risk for the type of livelihood one chooses to pursue. Benefits need to be flexible, customizable, and fit the nature of every type of work. So the solution is very clear. It's portable benefits. By attaching benefits to the worker, Portable benefits bridge, build a bridge from traditional employment to the modern workforce without putting families at risk. In fact, this transition is already underway. Many states are spearheading portable benefit programs, and more than 10 states are taking a serious look at implementing portable benefits. In my state, California, there are over 200,000 Uber drivers alone that stand to benefit from such a program. That number doesn't include the thousands of photographers and freelance writers and hundreds and hundreds of other uh, types of freelancing uh, that uh, exist across the Golden State and across the country. Now, I'll be the first to admit that neither California nor the Department of Labor uh, have been especially supportive of independent workers, uh, quite the contrary. However, I see policy movement in this direction as common ground that we can all share, regardless of which side we've been on on some of these more uh, vexing issues to this point. With that, I look forward to the insights of our witnesses, and uh, I yield to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kiley, and uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, basic worker protections, including fair wages, reasonable hours, and safe workplaces are grounded in two key employment laws the Fair Labor's, Labor Standards Act, and the Occupational Safety and Health Act. But unscrupulous firms have sought ever since to erode protections which generations of exploited workers fought and sometimes died to achieve. Many companies are now squeezing workers to save money by shifting away from direct employer-employee relationships to outsourced subcontractors and hiring what they claim are independent contractors. Doing this benefits companies by saving, saving labor costs while offloading risk to workers. Committee Republicans can rebrand misclassifying workers as independent contractors or gig workers a thousand times over. But the problem is the same. These workers are deprived of basic protections like minimum wage, paid leave, and safe workplaces. Instead of following the law, gig platforms have worked in state legislatures across the country to change the law around their models. More recently, after mounting reports of horrific on-the-job incidents, assaults, and working conditions, 
gig platforms have begun to propose what seems on the surface to be generous new supplements to workers' income. But as they've funneled millions into campaigns for portable benefits, they are counting to, to push, they are continuing to push for special laws to support their business practice of misclassifying workers as independent contractors. In California, for example, gig platform companies spent over $200 million on Proposition 22, a ballot measure that forced gig platform drivers to be classified as independent contractors. In exchange, gig, gig platform companies established portable benefits that are weak replacements for health insurance, paid leave, and other essential benefits. And even these watered-down benefits are inaccessible for most applicable workers. In a 2021 survey of 531 California drivers, only 10% reported receiving a health care stipend, which, might, which I might add only covers 82% of the cost of a bronze plan in the ACA marketplace. If corporations with multi-billion dollar valuations are truly interested in improving the lives of their workers, they can start by ending the practice of misclassifying their workers as independent contractors. Unfortunately, a consistent lack of profitability suggests that misclassification is not a coincidence, but a core principle of gig platform's business model. Our policy choices shape workers' rights and conditions of employment. Congress can strengthen and modernize protections for American workers while also promoting innovation. Misclassifications are not an innovation. And finally, I, finally, I'd like to make one last point. This subcommittee should be focused on improving workers' protections. This is the fifth time that this subcommittee has met this Congress, yet four of the five hearings have focused on how Congress can tilt the scale in favor of corporations to allow them to improve their bottom line on the backs of workers. We've had, a zero, we've had no hearings on abusive child labor violations. We've had zero hearings on wage theft, which robs workers of billions of dollars every year. That is billions with a B. According to the Economic Policy Institute, Americans lose more from wage theft than all robberies, burglaries, and motor vehicle thefts combined. We have had zero hearings on how to protect workers from unsafe conditions such as heat or deadly airborne viruses. And these are the issues that we should be fo focused on and not how we can deny Uber drivers access to affordable health care or a reliable retirement plan or unemployment insurance or, or employment training or overtime or paid leave. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle have also ha ha have us in a race to the bottom. And for the sake of workers in our economy, I hope that this will be the last hearing where the basic rights of workers are ignored. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Pursuant to Committee Rule 8C, all committee, member, committee members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee court electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. after 14 days from the date of this hearing, which is April 25th, 2024. And without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 14 days after the date of this hearing to allow such statements and other extraneous material referenced during the hearing to be submitted for the official hearing record. I will now turn to the introduction of our distinguished witnesses. Our first witness today is Ms. Kristen Sharp, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Flex Association, located here in Washington, DC. Our second witness is Ms. Gabriella Hoffman, who is a Senior Policy Analyst for the Independent Women's Forum Center for Economic Opportunity, located in Winchester, Virginia. Our third witness is Dr. Katie Wells, who is a postdoctoral Fritz Fellow at the Tech and Society Initiative at Georgetown University here in DC. And our final witness is Dr. Leia Palagishvili, who is a Senior Research Fellow with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, located in Arlington, Virginia. We thank the witnesses for being here today and look forward to your testimony. Pursuant to committee rules, I would ask that you each limit your oral presentation to a five-minute summary of your written statement. I would also like to remind the witnesses to be aware of their responsibility to provide accurate information to the subcommittee. I will first recognize Ms. Sharp. Chairman Kiley, Ranking Member Adams, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Kristen Sharp, and I'm the CEO of the Flex Association, the voice of the app-based economy. 
We represent America's leading rideshare and delivery companies, DoorDash, Grubhub, Hop, Skip, Drive, Instacart, Lyft, Shipt, and Uber. We believe in creating opportunities for people to live, work, and run their businesses on their own terms. The app-based economy is an opportunity economy. It's enabled thousands of restaurants and merchants to grow and compete in today's economy and better prepared them for the future. For consumers, the app-based industry has brought unparalleled savings, choice, and convenience. And for workers, it's an opportunity to be your own boss. Being your own boss is a powerful thing. Whether you're a single parent, a student, or a recent retiree, app-based innovations provide additional opportunities to earn money with flexibility and control over your time and earnings. We're still a young industry, but one that's quickly been embraced by millions of Americans. Last month, Flex released the first ever app industry economic impact report. The top line, the industry contributed more than $212 billion in GDP last year. As we look to the future, our mission at Flex is to ensure that app-based innovations continue to deliver for American consumers and workers, which is why we're excited to spend time today discussing a portable benefits system. One key way to support independent workers is to facilitate their access to portable benefits, benefits tied to the person rather than the job. Independent work outside a traditional employer-employee relationship is not new. In fact, Upwork estimates that 64 million people earned freelance income last year alone. And technologies like apps have made accessing freelance work easier than ever, at the touch of a button for anyone who wants to open the app. This work offers a level of autonomy not possible in a traditional job. An app-based worker, you don't have to log on for a specific amount of time, or at a particular time, or even a particular place. You can multi-app or, or, or earn through more than one company to, at a time at your own discretion. In short, you can work as much or as little as the market allows, when, where, and if you want, in ways that make sense for your life and personal obligations. That flexibility and scalability is what people like about this work. It's what drew 7.3 million active drivers in 2022 alone. And data bears this out. 90% of app-based workers say flexibility is why they choose to drive or deliver. Workers value flexibility so much that a majority say they'd choose to keep their flexible schedule rather than receive a 50% pay bump with a fixed schedule. The common thread is that app-based work is overwhelmingly additive, and nearly two-thirds of app-based earners spend 15 or fewer hours per week earning. So why do traditional W-2 employees have better access to benefits? First, federal and state employment laws are partly to blame. Misclassifying a worker as an independent contractor even unintentionally, can trigger liability. So companies choosing to provide independent workers with benefits under the wrong circumstances could open themselves up to substantial legal risk. Second, conventional workplace benefits are tied to the employer rather than the worker, so people have to change them every time they change jobs. This model just doesn't work for independent workers. Last summer, Flex released a set of principles to guide portable benefits development. To work well, portable benefits must be flexible, so that workers can choose the kind of benefits they need, portable, so that contributions are tied to the worker so that they can accrue from more than one income source, and proportional to their earnings. Any potential federal portable benefits framework will take time. In the meantime, states are experimenting with ways to support independent workers. Just last week, for instance, DoorDash launched a new portable benefits pilot program in partnership with Pennsylvania Governor Shapiro in the hopes that it can serve as proof of concept. Utah is following suit. In conclusion, Congress can support state efforts by clarifying that a company's contributions to a portable benefits program authorized by state law cannot be used as a factor in determining a worker's labor classification status. Companies looking to improve the status quo and enhance independent work should not be penalized for their creativity. Members of the subcommittee, we appreciate your dedication to entrepreneurship and American ingenuity. And we look forward to working with you on policies that make sense for the 21st century economy. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Sharp. I will now recognize Ms. Hoffman. Chairman Kiley, Ranking Member Adams, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing to explore portable benefits access for independent contractors. My name is Gabriella Hoffman, and I'm a senior policy analyst with the Independent Women's Forum Center for Economic Opportunity. We're a nonprofit organization that advances policies that enhance people's freedom, opportunities, and well-being. My work has chiefly focused on exploring opportunities for independent contractors. 
I am also an award-winning freelance writer and media strategist who has personally benefited from ind independent contracting opportunities. Today, 64 million Americans partake in full-time, part-time, or occasional freelance work. It's estimated that half the workforce, or 86.5 million individuals, will partake in flexible work by 2027. These workers overwhelmingly desire to maintain their independence and don't self-identify as traditional W-2 employees. Nevertheless, regulators frequently target these individuals using worker classification tests intended to force them back into employee arrangements, alleging they don't have access to benefits like health insurance. They believe they know what's best for these workers, but let's put that hubris aside. To deter force reclassification while preserving worker flexibility, policymakers should create a voluntary portable benefit system that decouples benefits like health insurance from traditional employment. The Journal of Economic Perspectives found that 80% of self-employed U.S. workers would support a voluntary portable benefits program. While some self-employed workers forgo benefits like health insurance, many do secure coverage on their own or get coverage through spouses and family members. About 25% of freelance workers don't possess health benefits but could be open to obtaining them through a voluntary portable benefits program. Given the success of portable benefits for employees, the model could be replicated for independent contractors and gig workers considering benefits. States are already adopting the portable benefits model for freelancers. In March 2023, Utah became the first state in the U.S. to create a voluntary portable benefits plan for independent contractors and gig workers. The law states that portable benefit plan contributions are voluntary and can't be used to determine an individual's worker classification status. Utah isn't the only state exploring portable benefits for independent contractors. Similar proposals have been introduced and debated in Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Jersey, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. In 2022, Washington State established a portable benefits program for rideshare drivers who are independent contractors. Following the disastrous rollout of California's ABC test that forcibly reclassified most Golden State independent workers as traditional employees, Californians supported a ballot measure to allow rideshare drivers to keep their independent status while enjoying access to limited benefits. Federal lawmakers have similarly mulled creating a portable benefits grant fund to incentivize states, localities, and nonprofit organizations to experiment with portable benefits models. If the government refuses to, be to modernize benefits, the free market is fully capable of developing and revolutionizing a voluntary portable benefits program. In 2008, the Freelancers Union established the first ever portable benefits system for freelancers under the freelance insurance company to offer benefits. And last week, financial technology company Stride announced the establishment of a pilot portable benefits savings account program, Stride Contributions, for DoorDash drivers in Pennsylvania. Independent contractors are their own best negotiators and are fully capable of securing their own benefits without the threat of forced reclassification into W-2 employee, employee status. To further unleash our economy's economic potential, policymakers must bring labor and tax law into the 21st century to ensure all workers, not just employees, can have access to and pay into a benefits program should they choose. During my time as a full-time freelancer, I was empowered in my work and fully capable of obtaining benefits on my own accord without entities mandating choices. Flexibility and freedom are primary motivations to enter independent contractor work arrangements, but freelancers like me, regardless if they're full-time, part-time, or occasional freelancers, shouldn't have to choose between independence and securing benefits like basic dental, health, and vision coverage. More American workers will make the jump into flexible work arrangements if they know they will have some security with respect to benefits. I thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today and your willingness to educate the public about making portable benefits a viable option for independent contractors who desire them. Thank you very much, Ms. Hoffman. Uh, I now recognize Dr. Wells. Thank you, Chairman Kiley, Ranking Member Adams, and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to testify. My name is Katie Wells, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Georgetown University. For eight years, I've investigated the working conditions and policy campaigns of the largest gig economy companies in the U.S. Last year, I published a report about the instant delivery industry, as well as a book about Uber. Today, I will address the shortcomings of new portable benefit proposals. True portable benefits are substantial programs that are maintained across jobs, like Social Security, unemployment insurance, and paid family leave. The new portable benefit proposals put forward by gig companies are different. They're restricted to specific sectors and negligible in size. The new DoorDash pilot program that we've begun to hear about offers drivers who work a certain amount on its platform alone a tiny subsidy of 
This means a driver who earns $2,000 in a month will receive $80 in benefits. While gig companies and their associations promote this program as a policy innovation, in reality, it is two things. One, an inferior contribution for workers, and two, a public giveaway for corporations. New benefit proposals are a distraction from the ongoing problem of worker misclassification, which denies workers actual benefits. What is often lost in debates about misclassification is it is not just the workers who lose out, the public and our government lose out too. Gig companies amass billions of dollars in valuations but avoid even the most basic contributions to social programs. During the pandemic, the federal government created an emergency assistance program for tens of millions of American gig workers. The gig companies did not contribute a dime, leaving the federal government with an $80 billion bill. In interviews with hundreds of Uber and Lyft drivers, Instacart delivery shoppers, elderly care workers, and app-based nurses, I have seen firsthand the costs of misclassification. This year, I met Ashley, a 31-year-old certified nursing assistant, or CNA, in Pennsylvania. For two years, Ashley has worked in nursing homes through ShiftKey, a new platform that classifies her as an independent contractor. On ShiftKey, Ashley can technically set her own rate and bid on shifts. But to actually win shifts over peers, she's had to lower and lower her hourly rate. It's a race to the bottom. Ashley is also required to pay $6 in fees for each shift, as well as annual bills for drug tests and vaccines. She is uninsured and receives no paid sick leave. As she puts it, quote, you get treated differently because you're not an employee. Ashley's working conditions would not be improved with a kind of portable benefit proposals put forward by gig companies. To make matters worse, labor platforms like ShiftKey are part of a massive lobbying effort to exempt themselves from labor standards. As I document in my new book, Uber has been at the forefront of this decade-long and nationwide campaign to minimize regulation of gig companies. Since 2017, Uber and its peers have won legislation already in 34 states to preempt municipal law. Gig companies are aggressively pitching proposals like portable benefits to soften the image of their exploitative business. Portable benefits are a new strategy to fortify an old model of worker misclassification and tax avoidance. These new so-called benefit plans hurt app-based labor platforms like ShiftMed and Gale that play by the rules and rightly pay into Social Security, unemployment insurance, and paid family leave. ShiftMed and Gale offer their healthcare workers both the flexibility to choose their shifts on an app and the protections they deserve as American workers. But it is unfair and impractical for these companies to have to compete with companies like ShiftKey that shirk their responsibilities to workers like Ashley. Thank you. Thank you. And our final witness uh, is Dr. Leah Palagashvili. Uh, uh, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, good morning, Chairman Kiley and members of the Subcommittee on Workforce Protections. It is an honor to testify before you. My name is Leah Palagashvili, and I'm a labor economist at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. I study the independent workforce and the changing nature of work. My research on flexible benefits for independent workers has motivated le uh, state legislative reforms over the past year, as we heard in Utah, and I'd like to share some of those insights with all of you. My testimony today focuses on legalizing independent contractors' access to fringe benefits. And this is beyond the, what gig economies are doing with portable benefit solutions across states. My three key points are, one, independent contractor lives would be enhanced if they had access to benefits. Two, states are experimenting with various portable benefits models so that workers um, are not forced to choose between structured employment with, with benefits on the one side and 
flexible work without benefits on the other side. And three, federal policy can provide a safe harbor for state and local experimentation with these portable benefit systems. On my first point, um, it's a rare chance when your research so closely connects to your personal life. So before I dive into the subject matter, I would like to share a brief story. In January 2020, my father, who is sitting right behind me actually, lost his work. He has been a driver, uh, he had been a driver his whole life, even before coming to the United States. The US company he had been contracting with told him they are moving away from an independent contractor model to an employment-based model. My father was offered a position to become a full-time employee at the company. Now, what did he do? He actually turned it down. He continued to remain without work until he found an opportunity to be an independent contractor again. What my father's story illustrates is that regardless of worker classification policies that may tip the scale in one direction or the other, like the Department of Labor's recent independent contracting rule or what happened in California with Assembly Bill 5, there will still be millions of US workers who will continue to engage in independent contracting or self-employed work just because they want to. For some, like my father, being a contractor that rather than an employee gives him some freedom to work on side projects and side businesses. For others, it's out of necessity. Some workers have disabilities or life circumstances that hinder their participation in the labor market. And for the vast majority of independent contractors, as found by the IRS tax records on this, and especially those on app-based delivery and transportation platforms, being a contractor rather than an employee is simply about the opportunity to make side income or engage in side hustling. So the question before us is how to address the challenges confronting millions of independent contractors who will choose to remain self-employed regardless of the broader worker classification debates. This brings me to my second point, where portable or flexible benefits reforms can be monumental. One of the key challenges today is that regulations restrict organizations from providing independent contractors with benefits. If an, organ if an organization were to provide benefits to their independent contractors, it would risk that worker being reclassified as an employee. This discourages companies from providing benefits to independent contractors. That means our current regulatory framework does not provide an option for workers to have access to both independent jobs and to benefits. This is why states are now beginning to experiment with various portable benefits models. Last year, Utah passed a bill that removes the presence of benefits as a factor in worker classification tests, as, as we heard already. And other states are experimenting with other solutions like tax credits for independent contractors and so forth. And as we heard again just last week, uh, the back, with the backing of Pennsylvania's governor, the platform company DoorDash launched, launched the first of its kind portable benefits uh, program, making contributions to a worker's flexible savings account managed by the benefits company Stride. These are just a few ideas of how states are implementing reforms to help all workers, not just employees, better step into the future. And now my third point is the vital role that pol federal policy can play to help legalize access to benefits for independent contractors. This past year, I co-led the Utah Flexible Benefits Working Group under the leadership of Utah Senator John Johnson. One of the key takeaways was that the biggest barrier to flexible benefits implementation in Utah was fear from the federal level. Companies were discouraged from providing benefits to independent contractors in Utah, regardless of the new state law, because they could still be penalized by agencies like the IRS and the Department of Labor. Therefore, federal policymakers should create a safe harbor. A policy would need to explicitly state that no federal agency can use the presence of benefits to determine whether a worker is an independent contractor or an employee. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Under Committee Rule 9, we will now uh, question witnesses under the five-minute rule. I will recognize the representative from Illinois, Ms. Miller, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Kylie, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. Ms. Hoffman, as noted in your written testimony, half of the U.S. workforce is expected to be freelancing by 2027. As an independent contractor yourself, can you explain what is so attractive about independent work? I would be happy to, Representative Miller, and thank you for your support of the independent contracting lifestyle. Independent contracting, freelancing, however you call it, contingent worker kind of work relationships, they've been around for a long time. It's not just a new mode of work. They've actually been around for, I think, since the inception of the country. People have worked independently. 
I learned about independent contracting from my father, who's a general contractor, and he ran, runs his own business. I'm from California originally. We saw what California policies did. In Virginia, where I live, it's much more attractive. But I started to do freelancing seven and a half years ago, almost eight years ago, because I was partly interested in doing it. And then I was, I took a job I didn't like, and I figured I had to dig myself out of a bad opportunity, work my way up. And within three years of starting independent contracting, I was able to really make it. They say women usually take about three years to achieve some modicum of success in freelancing. And once you do, you can chart forward. And for me, I saw a lot of success being a full-time freelancer. It's changed a little bit. I do it more on a part-time basis now these days. But you're empowered, you have control of your work, you can work with multiple people, you can make a lot of money, um, you can work with, I mean, for me, it's, it's about working with incredible clients. I get to travel the country, I get to film and speak and do stuff in conservation, hunting, fishing, wildlife, lots of different issues as well. And you're just empowered and, and to lose that ability to not have flexibility to choose who you work with, how to work, and your earnings could be very detrimental to the future of this workforce. And especially as you mentioned in my testimony, the fact that the economy is naturally, the markets are dictating the shift to a flexible work arrangement for the government to not welcome that, but rather to inhibit that would stifle so many people's livelihoods as we see not only in California, but all across the country. And so I like to extol the benefits because I've personally you know, been on the receiving end of it. I've encouraged people to go into freelancing when they've really been on kind of the, the sorts of, of being displaced from the workforce. It's a, a, an alternative if you don't like your W-2 arrangement or you want a hybrid. Um, so more and more people, young people especially, I'm a millennial and I talk to Gen Zers, millennials, and for them, this is the way that they want to work. Mm -hmm. And having a portable benefits option could compel more and more of them to consider this, especially if they're unsure of the kind of safety net or the kind of opportunities to have some security um, you know, from a W-2, a lot of people don't like working traditional jobs these days and mm -hmm. having flexibility through IC work or even gig work um, is going to really just revolutionize the workforce more and keep young people happy and wanting to work instead of being displaced or having unemployment. I agree. Ms. Hoffman, also, we've heard today that workers are misclassified as independent contractors instead of employees. Our efforts to reclassify self-employed individuals as employees are, is that helpful to these workers, especially when survey after survey shows the vast majority do not wish to lose the flexibility that working as an independent contractor provides? You're absolutely correct, Representative Miller. And efforts to forcibly reclassify independent contractors who self-identify, but also uh, Americans also perceive to be truly independent contractors, it's a losing issue. Doesn't matter how you vote, uh, where you lean politically, more and more people have recognized that if you force people out of these arrangements that they voluntarily, happily, and would be more than willing to maintain and protect, if you force those people out of work arrangements, they will be completely distraught. And, and they don't want to move back to something that's more constricting or something that is not so desirable for their lifestyle. At Independent Women's Forum, we work with a lot of women who are caretakers. They have you know, health needs personally. I have a friend in Virginia who's a fishing industry influencer, and she has health issues. And she said if she was still in a traditional W-2 employee work relationship, she wouldn't be able to set aside time for her health needs. So I've seen firsthand through my friend circle, uh, we talk to a lot of women. And, and personally speaking, too, you, you, you rid of that flexibility option by forcing people back into this under the guise of fighting misclassification, that would totally upend the economy and people's free will. And the cost of forced reclassification is tenfold sometimes, and depending upon the state that you, you look into. Rhode Island, I did some inquiry into that. Uh, their efforts to forcibly reclassify Rhode Island independent contractors, gig workers, back into W-2 employees could be 12-fold the cost of fighting so-called misclassification. So I don't think these efforts are worthwhile. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Thank you for your testimony. It's very helpful. I'll now recognize the ranking member, uh, Ms. Adams, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do want to um, uh, ask some questions. Uh, thank you all for, for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Wells, uh, you testified that Uber and other platform companies treat their workers as independent contractors yet they continue to exercise employer-like control over them. And so can you speak to some of the ways that the on-demand platform companies exert this kind of control? Sure, thank you. 
Gig companies across the spectrum continue to dictate how and when work is done despite touting the flexibility of their industry. Gig-based companies direct workers' interactions with customers, detail even what vehicles might be appropriate for the job, supervise and evaluate their workers' basic driving habits in ride-based economies like how fast they brake, how often they speed. These industries, apart from Uber, and its focus on driving, exert significant control over termination and promotion. The worker I described, Ashley, if she canceled a shift, she was less likely to get good bids for the next week. Okay. This industry sets all fair rates, they penalize workers for refusal of work, um, and most importantly, they hide the details of pay, so workers really struggle to figure out what exactly they will be compensated. Okay, I was gonna ask you about the <clears throat> the income and how they describe the conditions of their work and their ability to earn a decent income. Yeah, one worker said to me, it's a system of smoke and mirrors. Another said it was a mirage that they were ever able to achieve financial stability. I think what's important for us to know about gig work is that it includes opaque pay structures, things like tip baiting and promotion baiting, and most importantly, this thing called personalized pay. So on the same day, at the same hour, in the same workplace, two workers can be paid vastly different amounts for the exact same work. So that old adage of equal pay for equal work, it goes out the window. All right, let me move on and ask you, you mentioned a, uh, a legislative strategy uh, that you say Uber developed in Washington and took on the road to communities across the country. Uh, so what is that strategy uh, and the high investment of these companies in this strategy? Uh, for example, gig platforms invested more than $200 million in the California uh, Prop 22 campaign, and, and they've invested even more in Massachusetts. Uber has only reported an annual profit uh, once in 15 years of existence. Yeah, after a $31 billion loss with Saudi and SoftBank money. Um, the legislative strategy that Uber has taken on the road and then exported to these other industries um, is to break the law, convince customers that the law is unjust, and then change the law. Wow. So how, how is it that, that these companies have the resources for this investment when according to what's publicly reported about their finances, it sounds like they are, they are mostly money-losing enterprises? They may well be. I think it's been undecided whether they are profit creating, but what's important to keep in mind is if they do create a profit, it has been created through the unfair system of misclassification, which does not pay for the real costs of labor. Wow, okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for answering those questions and thank you for your work. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The representative from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, is recognized for five minutes. Okay, uh, first question for Ms. Sharp. Uh, if we reclassify, and this is clearly the goal of some people, reclassify independent contractors as employees, what, what, if, what effect will that have on them? What, what things will they perhaps not like about that reclassification? Yes, thank you very much for your question, uh, Congressman. I think it, first and foremost, it's important to recognize that there are fundamental differences between being an independent contractor and having control of your own time and being a traditional employee. Um, unlike a traditional employee, an app-based worker and any independent contractor can decide how long they want to work, whether or not they want to work, um, the frequency with which they work, and whether or not they work for a com competitor or another income source at the same time. None of those things are true in, in the traditional employer-employee relationship. I think that it is also really critical to recognize that 90% of app-based workers say that one of the key reasons they do the work is for flexibility. They like the fact that they have that kind of entrepreneurial control over their time and the scalability of their income that can go up and down at their discretion. More for people who like freedom, right? <laughs> a little more freedom, the, that sort of person. The, the, it's, a, it's an industry of people 
who are pursuing their financial goals, who are working around their personal obligations, and who um, are, are overwhelmingly opting into this industry, even when there are nine million traditional okay. jobs available. Yep. If, if we switch to some of these more portable benefits we're talking about today, uh, what would the uh, millions who work for the type of area in which independent contractors are, are the norm, DoorDash, Lyft, Uber, that sort of thing. How would they view the ability to get portable benefits? Well, I, I think they'd view it as the best of both worlds, sir. Um, they, they would be able to maintain their flexibility and freedom and independence, um, and they would be able to, at the same time, accrue benefits of their choosing fr from more than one income source. Okay. Uh, Ms. Palagashvili, see if we get that right, probably not. Uh, in your testimony, you say that most independent contractors are already W-2 employees somewhere else, but they choose to work as independent contractors on the site. First of all, I didn't know that. Is that true? Yeah, according to IRS tax records, this is on the IRS website, a study that they did, most independent contractors in the U.S. have full-time W-2 jobs, and they use independent contracting as a side income. And this is especially true in the app-based world, where almost all I should say our vast majority of app-based workers are side, use, um, use the app-based economy for side income or side hustles. I can really see why somebody who already had one job would really desire flexibility in that second job. So it really, if they had to have a, a traditional W-2 sort of job, that would probably be almost impossible, huh? Th that's correct, and that's, that's part of the problem, right? If you survey these workers, most of them say, well, I already have a W-2 job or I already have something else that I'm doing. I want this as side income or as side hustles. And for those workers, being employees, either as part-time or full-time employees doesn't make sense. Again, for those who are making it a side income, there might be some workers who you know, are full-time working independent contractors who want to be employees, but that's not the case for the majority of the workforce. That's the key emphasis. The majority of the workforce, especially in the app-based world, are supplemental earners who have full-time jobs elsewhere. Again, and this is, by the way, IRS tax records, Economic Policy Institute, progressive leaning, also found that um, using social security data that these self-employment opportunities tend to be side income, not part of the main jobs. Thank you. Okay, uh, one more quick thing for Ms. Hoffman. We wanna get all three of you in here. Uh, California's AB5 reduced self-employment by about 11% in California. Despite the law's intent to push more people into traditional employment, AB5 led to a 4.5% drop in overall, overall employment. Is the administration's independent contractor rule likely to have similar effects here or nationwide? Congressman Grothman, yes. I, IWF believes that the independent contractor rule, which was just finalized, could have a similar deleterious effect. And we're going to be studying those effects very shortly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the chairwoman of the full committee, Dr. Fox, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Polish Kavili, according to your written testimony, our current regulatory framework does not provide an option for workers to have access to both independent jobs and to benefits, end quote. Could you discuss state efforts to remove barriers for workers to access flexible or portable benefits. Thank you for your question, Representative. So as I mentioned, the key thing is that independent contractors can't legally access benefits without there being a tax or reclassification risk. So what states are doing, like Utah, for example, uh, passed this last year, is they're re removing the presence of benefits as an indicator, as a factor, for whether a worker should be classified as an independent contractor uh, or an employee. And I, I want to mention again that states are doing this, and despite them doing this, there still needs to be a federal policy to, uh, uh, to allow this sort of growth of portal benefits solutions at the state level precisely because um, uh, companies and workers are still under IRS and DOL determination. So the IRS explicitly states this on, this on their website. If we see the presence of benefits to independent contractors, that's a little check mark for the employee side. So that exists. And these sort of policies that what states are doing in Utah are removing that presence of benefits 
uh, for determining whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor. Thank you. So what more could be done at the state level to encourage companies to offer portable benefits? That would be the first. It's a small step, but it's necessary because, again, it's about legalizing access to benefits for independent contractors. States could also work on different tax credits or tax incentives, both for independent contractors and, uh, and, uh, and companies. And th things like this can be done at the um, federal level as well. Um, other, other things that states are thinking about are association health plans so that um, independent contractors can band together and buy health insurance. Um, and at, at lower risk pool and, and therefore lower, reduc lower uh, pay premiums that they would have to pay for health insurance. But again, the key thing is kind of this barrier that exists both at the state level and at the federal level. And, it, and, and as I mentioned in my testimony, this is regard regardless of the broader worker classification debates. All it says is if federal policy can remove the presence of um, the benefits factor, that would at least help unleash access uh, to uh, benefits for independent contractors. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sharp, as has been discussed here today, app-based delivery and transportation platforms offer maximum flexibility and allow individuals to work on their own schedule. What do app-based independent contractors value more, flexible work schedule or having access to benefits? Thank you for the question, Dr. Fox. Um, I, I think that in truth, as we've discussed, flexibility is a key and critical reason that people are doing this work. And it's one of the things that, that motivates people to do the work. We, we have so many stories of people who have personal health issues, ch children with cancer, children with autism, and they need to work around doctor's appointments. We've talked a little bit already about the fact that uh, many, many workers are doing this to supplement a full-time job, to um, combat inflation, or to earn extra income and get ahead on their financial goals. Um, to, to, to clarify a little bit uh, some of the points that have come up earlier, 80% of workers in the app-based industry work fewer than 20 hours per week, and 60% 60 60 work fewer than 10 hours per week right. doing app-based earning. It is a it is a tool that people use to get ahead in their financial goals. That said, if they can keep that flexibility and also have an opportunity for benefits um, that, that accrue to them based on that earning, that's the best of both worlds. And do you think Congress should keep these workers' preferences in mind when considering changes affecting independent contractors? Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Hoffman, some estimates put the total number of American independent workers at over 70 million. Speaking as someone who performs independent work yourself, will you discuss why flexible benefits might be attractive to those currently working as independent contractors? Thank you, Representative Fox. Yes, as independent contractors, when you're, let's say, maybe facing some health issues or you just want to have more security, um, portable benefits could be a feasible option for you. Having gone through the Obamacare marketplace, which I don't find to be very portable, personally speaking, having limited options, um, a truly portable benefit system would allow more choice, more offerings, lead to cheaper health care options, and plans that are more customizable. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Burleson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I yield my time to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Wells, do you support reclassifying uh, independent contractors as employees against their will? I support independent contractors for the gig economy being reclassified. Not all independent contractors everywhere are misclassified, certainly not. But absolutely, we know that in the gig economy, companies like Uber, Lyft, Shift, uh, Shift Key, Shift Med, Care, Rev, a whole host of companies are not treating their workers fairly. Okay, uh, it, but let's just return to the question. Do you support reclassifying independent contractors as employees against their will? For those, for those workers that work in the gig economy, absolutely. You do? You support reclassifying them against their will? Well, we don't have evidence to show that it is against their will. We know we that workers okay, choose. Okay, you have a couple living, breathing, independent contractors right here. Uh, Ms. Hoffman. Not for the gig uh, economy. She oh, does not work me. for the gig economy. Excuse me. Thank you. Dr. Palagashvili's uh, father, right behind you there, uh, they say they prefer being independent contractors, but you think you should be able, the government should force them into the employee of someone else against their will. You support that. 
I believe that Uber drivers, I believe that shift key nurses, I believe that a whole host of PAPA, elderly care workers, should be given both the flexibility to pick their own shifts as well as the protections they deserve. We know that those two things are not incompatible. Okay, but you just told us on the record that you support reclassifying them against their will. So I guess that you know, raises the question, why do you think you know what's best for someone like Ms. Hoffman or Dr. Paul Gashvili's father who's sitting behind you better than they know what's best for themselves? We know that the gig economy has a turnover rate of about six months because though workers are attracted to the flexibility it offers, it does not deliver. Workers end up leaving this because they choose stability over the promise of flexible scheduling. If workers could have both flexible scheduling and stability and financial earnings, they choose it. Do you have any response to that, Ms. Sharp, this idea that uh, Dr. Wells uh, believes she knows what's best for an independent contractor like Ms. Hoffman uh, more than she knows what's best for herself? 83% of people who work in the app-based industry would recommend the work to friends and family. To me, that says that this is work that is satisfactory and is something that people want to do. 77% of people in our 10,000-person study, not a 41-person study, um, say that they uh, prefer being an independent contractor. But more than that, there are particular stories of people who do this because it works for them and their families. I have a story from Maryland. I'm a single father raising my daughter with cerebral palsy completely by myself. Self. These jobs allow me time for my child and help me be financially secure and pay my bills. How, how can we say that we want to take away that kind of choice and flexibility from people who have looked at the cost benefits themselves and opted into this kind of work? And not only that, but now that we're uh, trying to pursue policy solutions that will, in fact, uh, make sure that benefits are available as well for folks who choose to make that choice, suddenly uh, there's opposition to that as well, which kind of goes to show you what was this really about uh, to begin with. But I wanted to touch on another topic, because um, uh, you testified uh, earlier that we need a safe harbor because currently federal law can look at the provision of benefits to independent contractors and use that as a basis to forcibly reclassify them uh, as employees. So just to make sure I understand your testimony correctly, you're, you're saying that employers who choose to extend benefits to independent contractors or states that put uh, programs or incentives in place to do that can effectively be punished and held liable for doing that. Is that right? Well, potentially, there, there's, a six, there's a rather ambiguous six-factor test that isn't limited to just those six factors at the federal level. And because of the lack of certainty, um, there, there isn't clarity for workers or, or companies in what it would look like if they were to take um, you know, pilot programs or experiment with new approaches to benefits. Sure. So, th so the solution there is to say, OK, if you choose to extend benefits, uh, to those who are independent contractors, that's not going to factor into the analysis. That would be the solution. Well, sir, I, I think you rightly pointed out in your opening statement that we are in a new world and we are looking at how to help people who are working in a different way than the traditional way do it. And, and because of that, you know, we're experimenting with what that could look like. And having more certainty and um, more ability to do that kind of experimentation and get those lessons learned is really critical in, in helping support these entrepreneurs. Great. Thank you very much. And I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I just want to go through what's at stake here. There's a difference between independent contractors and an employee. Uh, Dr. Wells, does an independent contractor get the minimum wage that employees get? No. Overtime? No. Unemployment insurance? No. Workers' comp? No. If the state has mandatory sick leave, if you're not an employee, do you get that? No. Do you get OSHA protection? No. Get the right to join a union? No. Now, if somebody wanted to work, um, do, you, uh, do you support forcing someone to take the minimum wage if they wanted to work for less than the minimum wage? Would you allow the employer to pay less than the minimum wage if the employee wanted to? No. Okay, just checking. Um, now, some of this seems like we're talking theory and not really um, something that would take place because it seems like it would, this, this portable benefits would only work if you've got a misclassified employee 
who's actually an employee and the employer is trying to get them some health insurance, notwithstanding the fact that they're really an employee and should be getting it anyway. Um, <clears throat> I mean, if uh, if I had an if I called an independent contractor like a plumber, how would the portable benefits work? Like a plumber? Yeah, if I called a plumber, do I get to add to pay the one day's health insurance? Pardon me. Would I get? Could I pay one day of his health insurance? I That's mean, a great a, question. If, if he's a, if he's a, if he's really an independent contractor, I mean, the price that I pay, he's on his own because he's independent. Now, we've heard, heard a lot about flexible benefits. Is there any barrier right now to an employee working flexible benefits like telework and setting their own schedule? You can still be an employee, is that right? Absolutely, and increasingly we see evidence of it. And that would depend if the employer said, no, nine to five and you gotta show up. If you insist on more flexibility, then you find somewhere else to work. Is that how it works? Okay. Now, we've heard about this check mark about if you get health insurance, that little check mark for getting health insurance doesn't determine that you're an employee, does it? Okay. Um, now, are there any barriers to um, providing health insurance to independent contractors? Right now, if you're an employee, you get health insurance and it's an expense to the business, but it is not in income, taxable income to the employee. If, if you're an independent contractor and the employer paid the independent contractor health insurance, would, you get the, would the employee get the income exclusion? I'm not a labor lawyer, and I'm not sure about that answer. And that's not within this jurisdiction. That's over in Ways and Means. But um, I think the answer is no. If you're not an employee, you don't get that uh, benefit. Um, but how would, the, how would you get health insurance if it's really an independent contractor and you're paying a contract price? Where is the health insurance? Um, that's the problem that I see with this thing. Um, if they're really independent contractors, they're independent and they're on their own, you set a contract price for the job, you pay the price, they get their own health insurance. If they are an employee, and it, this, thing, this thing only works if you're working with the same employer like an employee, um, they're trying to get you health insurance and they can't keep you uh, without providing health insurance because you go somewhere else and get health insurance. Now, what are the, if, if you're misclassified as an independent contractor, compared to a business that's playing by the rules and classifies somebody correctly as an employee, what would the employer save? The employer would save 20 to 40 percent of the costs. By misclassifying someone as yeah, an independent contractor. Yeah, it's highly contractor. profitable for companies because to do Because they don't so. have to pay minimum wage, they don't have to pay overtime, they don't have to pay unemployment compensation, they don't have to workers comp, they don't have to pay any of that. And they save a lot of money by misclassifying people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are you back? Uh, Ms. Uh, Hoffman, yeah, you are a uh, former Californian, I think, correct? Uh, and an independent contractor. Um, and you're very familiar with uh, the law AB5 that was passed in California, is that yes. right? And so uh, you probably remember as this was being debated, uh, the basic argument was sort of the one that the ranking member just presented, saying, well, independent contractors don't get this benefit and that benefit, uh, so we need this new law to force them into an employer-employee relationship, and then suddenly they'll have those benefits. So uh, is that the way it worked out in your experience studying what happened uh, in California? Uh, did this law suddenly just deliver a windfall uh, to all independent contractors uh, in the state? Is that what happened? You're absolutely correct, Chairman. Kylie, and it was intended to specifically go after gig workers, and then it eventually encompassed all independent contractors, those who identify as contingent workers, regardless if they're self-employed or part-time or occasional freelancers, and that was the intention. It was to find an easy target, and then with the law on un unintended or perhaps intended consequences, it was wide-sweeping, and it reached all different kinds of professions, journalists, florists, uh, 
so many different, too many professions to list. And so you saw that a lot of people, a sizable share of California's workforce, independent workforce, was displaced because of AB5's implementation. And California's economy is still suffering as a result of that law to this day. And we won't know the full effects. Uh, Leah has done exceptional research on that, but we will see some catastrophic effects from that still following uh, in the years to come. I mean, we saw hundreds of professions, right, where right away, as soon as the law was signed even, before it even took effect, uh, not only, you know, did they not suddenly receive uh, a whole menu of benefits, uh, they lost their ability to work entirely. And Dr. Palagashvili, you, uh, I, did you yourself write the study? Yep, that was me. I published the AB5 study that uh, Out of Gabriella okay. quoted. So yeah. <laughs> can you tell us about that? Because your study yeah. really documented in an empirical way everything that we've been observing. Yeah, so I just want to clear up a misconception. So we tend to assume that when we pass these laws, like California's AB5 or uh, greater regulations that make it more difficult to be an independent contractor, that companies will automatically reclassify all those contractors into employees. But that that's a misconception because companies have three options, right, under a new regulation. Option number one, reclassify contractors as an employee, okay? That's the one that um, everyone seems to want. Option number two, they determine that I'm a magazine and I don't want to hire Ms. Wells as a photographer, you know, hypothetically speaking here, Dr. Wells, excuse me, as a photographer um, for the magazine. And they might decide that I don't want to work with this contractor because it's no longer legal under the new regulation. And then option number three is they re redefine the, the agreement so that it's now legal under the new law. So Everyone is assuming that all companies will do option number one, reclassify all independent contractors as employees. Now, we studied this using the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Census Bureau's uh, current population survey um, and looked at what, are the, what happened in California post AB5 because it's a, it's a natural and curious question to see did more workers become um, traditional W-2 employees post AB5. What we found is that for affected occupations, we don't find consistent evidence that those workers became W-2, traditional W-2 employees. But what we find instead is significant drops in self-employment, again, for affected occupations. So what that means in the story between the, con the photographer and the contractor company is that many organizations looked at their relationship with this contractor, realized it's a sporadic or a regular contract. It doesn't make sense to bring them on as a full-time or part-time employee, or in some cases, maybe they asked the worker, like my, my father's, a con uh, situation, do you want to be an employee? He said no. And so, um, and as a result, what we see is drops in self-employment for affected occupations, but we don't find consistent or robust evidence of increases in traditional W-2 employment for affected occupations. And that goes contrary to the wishes of lawmakers. And again, it goes back to the scenario that there's three options, right, that companies, organizations can do with contractors that they work with. We, by assuming that they're going to do the best intended op option, that's just one, that's not a realistic situation or scenario. And as an economist, we have to analyze all, all considerations, all scenarios. Um, and that's what we did with the study, looked at what actually happened in California post AB5. Thank you. So even if we accept uh, every premise of the argument we have on the other side, that there's a trade-off here and that we, the government needs to fiat uh, the decision for for workers, uh, it still doesn't, the, our actual experience with it doesn't vindicate that argument because workers are not receiving benefits. In many cases, they're losing their livelihoods entirely. Is that That's right? right. We don't find a consistent evidence that traditional W-2 employment increased in California post AB5, which means that the workers didn't get those intended benefits that they were supposed to. Thank you very much. I will now recognize uh, the ranking member for a closing statement. Oh, looks like we have a... Uh, Ms. Stevens, you're ready to go? I'll the gentle uh... lady from Michigan <laughs> is ready to go. <laughs> Here we find ourselves at another uh, education and workforce subcommittee hearing talking about uh, the plight of independent contractors. And I, I, I'll just say this, and, and certainly want to get the, the folks chiming in, appreciate the expertise, the research, uh, that, that, that is represented on this uh, panel, as, as well, frankly, as the lived experience uh, of, of some of you. You know, Americans are all just trying to get by, right? They're trying to live the American dream. They're trying to live to fight another day, put food on the table. We, we know that uh, credit card debt is over a trillion dollars, that going to the grocery store 
is uh, oftentimes a frightening experience for individuals, uh, just as it's been to, to fill a prescription. And when I think about the responsibility that all of us have here as members of Congress to create a fair and equal society that delivers day in and day out for the American people, I, I, I think about the, the role that our agencies play in helping to achieve some of the guarantees of retirement, of uh, uh, being able to, to pay for, for medical bills and have uh, affordable in, insurance. And so doc, Dr. Wells, um, I, I particularly you know, love for you to just re-chime in here, <laughs> chime in yet again um, on some of your, your research uh, in terms of uh, the gig economy and gig workers. Uh, because I get it, a lot of people who are participating in the gig economy, they need that flexibility. You know, we, we have legislation now in the Congress that is focusing on a 32-hour work week. I've yet to talk to my former chair ranking member here, uh, Mr. Mr. Scott, about that, that, that legislation. But that legislation represents people who want flexibility, who need flexibility. We had a 40-hour work week grinding it out because it was one-income households. Now it's dual-income households, and you add in children to the mix, and you add in some of those doctor's appointments. And so that flexibility to earn extra wages is, I believe, really important, and that's something that we see with the gig economy. But then we start to look at it, and where did the pay-fors go? in terms of being able to pay into Social Security, pay you know, in, into your future. And I just wonder who's holding the bag because we all know that in addition to the over trillion dollars of credit card debt that Americans are holding, the staggering lack of savings for retirement is so real. So I was just wondering if you could kind of speak to some of these realities that your research has uncovered and how the system that we have right now might not be benefiting people for their future. That's oftentimes arriving faster than we realize. Thank you. Thank you, yes. And I would like to say that workers do want benefits before I answer this. They want benefits and they also want flexibility, and those two are not incompatible. The issue of scheduling flex flexibility is often held up as a red herring. Employees can have scheduling flexibility, but they don't have to trade in worker protections to have it. We know that shift workers in hotels and manufacturing plant workers, uh, manufacturing plants in hospitals, all of these cases, they have shown us in warehouses that workers can both choose the flexibility to take their dad to dialysis, their kid to its IEP meeting, you know, and take care of themselves while also not giving up the worker protections that we've built as a country to get together. Um, the problems of wage stagnation, credit card debt, student debt, underemployment are real, and I think it is no coincidence that since the Great Recession, we have seen the rise of associations like Flex that have taken advantage of this real need on the part of Americans who don't have savings to try to avoid financial disaster. Workers need extra income because of wage stagnation. They need it because they've taken on staggering amounts of human debt. But these jobs are not the answer, and the $80 portable benefit plan you know, that would be offered to a gig worker in Pennsylvania who earns $2,000 a month on DoorDash is not going to prevent that worker from any kind of financial disaster. Thank you very much, and I will now recognize the ranking member for a closing statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank our witnesses for being with us today. A priority on the Workforce Protection Subcommittee must always be protecting workers. This seems to somehow be lost <clears throat> as the majority of the hearings we've had on this subcommittee so far have focused on ways to continue to squeeze workers in favor of helping unscrupulous employers' bottom lines. As more and more companies look for ways to save money, there's a tre troubling trend of shifting away from direct employer-employee relationships where you have all of the protections of the employee relationship, 
to outsourcing with subcontractors and using what are claimed to be independent contractors. Workers should not be forced to choose between voluntary portable benefits and guaranteed benefits which employees are entitled to, such as minimum wage, overtime, workers' comp, unemployment compensation, OSHA protections, and the right to join a union. It is possible that workers can be protected by fundamental labor standards and still have flexibility. Now, providing some of the benefits of being an employee to compensate for the damage done by a worker being misclassified is not enough. Uh, we, of course, um, the determination of when someone is an employee or an independent contractor is still going to be, is always going to be complicated. There are going to be people close to the line. But it is not solved by promoting a plan that really doesn't work for really true independent contractors. Furthermore, there's really no barrier under present law to provide health, pension, and other benefits to people, independent contractors, except if they're really independent, it's logistically uh, uh, complicated. Now, policy, policy choices shape workers' rights and conditions of employment. We should be strengthening and modernizing protections for American workers while also promoting innovation. I hope we can do this in our next hearing, and I yield back. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, all our witnesses for your testimony. I think the basic question here is, are we going to look backwards or are we going to look forwards? And, you know, the Department of Labor uh, in this administration uh, seems intent on moving us backwards and trying to force millions of American workers against their will uh, into an arrangement that they have chosen to forego and that is out of step with their line of work and the nature of the modern economy. And so on this committee, we're trying to look forward. We're recognizing that you know, within a few years, we could ha well have half of the American workforce uh, doing independent work of some kind. And so we're asking, how can we support those choices? And what policy levers are available uh, to provide those workers with a greater sense uh, of personal security? And so access to portable benefits, I think, is a really important step in helping to usher in uh, that future. And we had a really startling admission today uh, from the uh, witness designated by the minority uh, who is essentially offering the line uh, of the radical uh, Biden Labor Department uh, when she testified on the record that she supports forcing independent contractors to become employees, forcing them to work for someone else against their will, even if that's not what they want. And so nothing could be further from what we're trying to do and accomplish on this committee. We believe in supporting workers. We believe in empowering workers. And so that's why we respect the decision of workers to be an independent contractor or to be an employee. And it's also why we want to assure that if they make the decision to be independent contractors, they have access to benefits to support themselves uh, and their family as well. And as a matter of fact, when you shift that paradigm to where the benefits follow the worker as opposed to being attached to a particular employer, uh, you empower them in a further way because then they can make career decisions in a way that best suits uh, their needs, their talents, uh, as opposed to uh, you know, having their entire benefits tied to one particular employer. So I think this has been uh, a really helpful hearing, maybe, one of, maybe the most important one we've had uh, so far this Congress. And I think we have some great steps to take uh, moving forward. Uh, I'm going to be working on legislation uh, related to the issue that several witnesses have discussed to make sure that we can support state efforts uh, to provide portable benefits by assuring that uh, there is not a perverse effect then of uh, that uh, being used to kind of punish uh, hiring entities who extend such benefits uh, by saying that now they're going to be held liable for misclassifying their workers. This sort of safe harbor provision I think is a really important, it's a modest a uh, bit important step. And then more broadly, I'm looking forward to working uh, with colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, on the larger questions of how we can uh, help to usher in access to portable benefits uh, for every independent contractor in America. And, you know, I think we had supportive comments uh, to an extent from one of uh, our colleagues on the other side of the dais today. We have bipartisan legislation, actually, that started in the Senate uh, that is uh, uh, along those lines. And so I think there's a lot of common ground uh, to work on here, to work with here. And uh, I'm uh, you know, excited about the opportunity we have to support both the freedom of workers to direct their own career paths and the security uh, to be able to support themselves and their family. So without objection, there being no further Mr. business. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, 
Yes. Ask unanimous consent to enter in the record two, two letters, one from the National Employment Law Project, NELP, um, on the need for caution regarding the development of portable benefits. And the second is a comment letter from the ARP in support of the Biden administration's independent contractor rule, which elaborates on the importance of protecting older Americans from misclassification. Without objection. There being no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned.